So I'm going to be talking about responsible data science, and it's a topic that I think is incredibly important, and I hope by the end of this talk that you're going to agree and think it is very important as well. Um, and uh, my goals in this talk, like any good uh, professor, I hope to kind of educate you a little bit. Um, I hope to excite you about some of the opportunities in this space, uh, caution you as far as some of the pitfalls, and ideally have you come away with tools. And the tools, you know, some of it is to separate out hype from reality, but in particular tools, especially as machine learning and AI practitioners, so that you can go out and have these conversations about responsible data science that I think are incredibly important. Um, one of them is to avoid a lot of the magical thinking that's happening right now around AI and machine learning. Um, also to kind of unpack the black box that is oftentimes being proposed around AI and machine learning systems. You know, we already heard about the need for explainable systems uh, and so on, uh, and many other issues I have a feeling throughout this conference. And to come away with an ability to have a healthy skepticism towards what's coming out of these algorithms that's actually informed and informed by literacy. So literacy that's computational literacy, literacy that's statistical literacy, literacy that's domain liter um, literacy, <laughs> um, and also ethical literacy. And so one of the ways in which I'm going to be grounding this discussion throughout my talk is to think a little bit, uh, take a bigger view towards um, the machine learning and AI systems that we're developing. And think of them as socio-technical systems. So socio-technical system is a term that comes from the um, science, technology, and society community. But you know, basically, it just means people and technology interacting. And you're going to see throughout my talk, I'm going to be kind of referring back to this kind of systems view, this more holistic view towards how algorithms interact with um, people. The other thing that I'm going to be talking about, and again, um, it was nice to see this also foreshadowed in the previous talk, is kind of the different types of algorithms. So we have data-driven algorithms, but I'm going to advocate also having knowledge-based algorithms. And now, you know, this is an old topic from AI of kind of the mix between machine learning and kind of a logic-based reasoning. I think there's a real need to uh, revisit, revamp, and reinvigorate this discussion, and responsible data science is particularly the place where um, kind of how do you take knowledge, domain knowledge, how do you take knowledge of how you want your systems to work, what kind of guarantees do you need, and um, develop algorithms that can support these. So in my talk, I have three different parts. So one of them is just going over the basics. And this is going to be very introductory, um, I think accessible to everyone. Uh, there's going to be a couple nuggets in there that are deceptively simple, but we found over and over again when we employ data-driven algorithms that by making use of these little statistical uh, constraints or structural constraints, they can improve performance significantly. Then I'm going to go uh, in the next section of the talk, a little bit more technical. I'm going to talk about both some uh, theoretical uh, results and also some systems results. And then in the last third of the talk, I'm going to pop up and talk about cautions. And these are kind of a broad level cautions that I think all of us should be aware of when we're thinking about responsible data science. 
And throughout, I'm going to suggest that the key questions for you to have in mind are kind of how um, to use these techniques, uh, when, why, and why not. So for the basics, let me get started. Uh, again, thinking of these uh, socio-technical systems. They're complex, they're connected, they're heterogeneous. And from a machine learning perspective, there's structure. And there's structure in both the inputs to the algorithms, the um, streams and observations coming in, but also the outputs. Um, and so by the structure and the input, I just mean, you know, the data is multimodal. There's all kinds of different entities. There's all kinds of different relationships of spatiotemporal. There's just a rich heterogeneity of data that's being generated these days. Um, and how do we make use of it for, in the best and most responsible way for our data science um, and machine learning algorithms? By structure and the outputs, I really mean this general area of structured prediction from machine learning. So think of the classic examples. So there's natural language processing, computer vision, computational biology, where when you're um, making a prediction, um, the other predictions depend on it. So a simplest example from NLP is part of speech tagging. You know, the part of speech that I predict for one word um, informs the part of speech that makes sense to have for nearby words. Um, but I really like this um, quote, actually, by Dan Roth from UPenn. All interesting decisions are structured, so there's dependencies. Nonetheless, um, I think most of our machine learning algorithms take this nice, uh, richly structured uh, data, they then flatten it, they put it into a tabular form. That tabular form is then something that you feed into whatever your existing machine learning or statistical algorithm is. And the, one of the issues when you do this flattening, you're essentially making an uh, independence assumption that for each row I can make its prediction independently. But the problem is that is an assumption, and it's often incorrect, especially in these crazy, complex socio-behavioral domains. Um, but also, the models aren't declarative. So usually when you're doing it, you do this kind of feature engineering that is what uh, computes the uh, columns that go into the table. And oftentimes, that information is lost. And um, losing that information is uh, really problematic for the maintainability, the debugging, the interpretability of the model. But the last piece is it also doesn't support collective reasoning. And collective reasoning is exactly this kind of structured output um, uh, type of reasoning that I want to emphasize here. And so collective reasoning is Rather than treating each prediction independently, how do we um, model the dependence? And oftentimes, the way that this works really well is to kind of make some sort of local prediction, but then make use of the relational context to improve the quality of that uh, prediction. And I'm going to lapse into using the term prediction many times, as I just did, but realize that I think of this as being important for both kind of discovery, so um, trying to do the pattern discovery one wants, and further for things like causal reasoning, where I'm actually going to make interventions, even though I'm not going to be talking about that here. So I'm going to give you these simple patterns of collective reasoning that I think are super useful and good to have in your toolkit. Uh, one is around information integration, one is around classification, and one is around recommendation. And the way that I'm going to be representing these is 
using um, logical rules. I'm going to use the logical rules because they are a nice way of expressing structure. Uh, but don't worry, I'm going to actually be backing off on that later. I'm, going, I'm just using it for convenience right now. So the first pattern is for information integration. And information integration is just so many machine learning problems require you to do some sort of matching and mapping between different digital references. And um, I have a toy example. Uh, this is from my current institution and one of my alma maters, uh, where I have documents that are talking about UC Santa Cruz, UCSC, and UC Santa Barbara, which was my undergrad alma mater. Um, actually, my master's I got from Berkeley, my PhD from Stanford, so I'm kind of making the tour of all the Bay Area institutions. Um, but I have these documents, and what I'd like to do is figure out which references refer to the same entity. And in the case where you have something like UCSC and UCSB, where there's one letter difference, you often do need some kind of context for unpacking that. And what are the key patterns that you can use to help with this? So one of the most basic ones is a kind of, you're looking in a single document, you know, you see Santa Cruz's mascot is the banana slug. Uh, and you're trying to figure out that the university is the referring to UC Santa Cruz. And then the school is referring to the university. And hence, the school is referring to UC Santa Cruz. So that pattern of inference is the simple transitive rule, where if R1 and R2 are the same, um, R2 and R3 are the same, then R1 and R3 are the same. So this little pattern is a very useful pattern to encode when it happens in your domains. Another kind of pattern is a relational pattern, where you know, if I have bigger document collections, and I want to essentially do these inferences and actually you know, figure out when things are the same, when they're the different, and make use of not only the um, same as relationship, but also the co-occur. So if I have um, that S1 co-occurs with R1, and S2 co-occurs with R2, then if R1 and R2 are the same, S1 and S2 may well be the same. And again, this isn't something that is going to hold in all cases. So it's uncertain. So I'm going to have to deal with that. And on top of it, I have to deal with it at scale. You know, This was a toy little example that just had a little bit of information. Really, what I want to be doing this over is a large um, settings. So this is one pattern that's useful. The next pattern, structural pattern, that's super useful is uh, what we call collective classification. And it's just the idea that you're inferring labels for nodes in graphs. And the pattern here is that you have some local predictor. So this could be anything that uses all of the features of an entity to predict a label. But then you also have this structural rule that says, well, if the label is for x is L, there's a link between x and y, then the label for y should be L. And how do you tell that this is collective because the unknowns, the labels, occur on both sides of the rule. So there's a dependency that's happening between them. And you know, here's a, again, kind of toy example of this where I'm trying to, in a social network, infer the political persuasion. 
so the political uh, affiliation of different individuals. And usually the way that this is set up is that you have some of the labels observed, so you have um, some known values, and then you have some set that are unobserved and you're trying to get a joint distribution for these. Now, how do I make use of um, these structural patterns? Well, I can use local information, simple things like, well, if X donates to a party, then they're likely to vote for that party. If they tweet about some phrase that has a particular uh, association, they're associated with that party. But the structural information, that link pattern, would be something like, you know, if X votes for a party, Y is friends with X, then Y will vote for that party. Um, if they're spouses, then they're likely to vote for that party. And again, I'm going to back off on these being logical rules, but these are just patterns that may hold in the data that I may want to be able to learn. Um, and from this, I can then go and label the um, missing um, attributes. So at this point, especially after this example, it's appropriate to have an aside, and that is about privacy. This technique that I just showed is exactly the thing that will leak information when you have relational information. And I've been in a number of conversations around privacy and big data and policy experts where kind of getting across this notion of inferential privacy and how much information can be leaked in this way is important. Um, one of my former PhD students, Elena Zaliva, who's now an assistant professor at University of Illinois Chicago, did some nice work um, actually a while ago at looking at privacy in online social networks, where here the notion of group membership was something that you didn't actually have control over who saw your group membership. And group memberships give away a huge amount of information. So this is a topic that I'm quite interested in. Um, and so uh, uh, talk to me more afterwards if this is something of interest to you. But back to our patterns, let me go through the last simple one, which is around um, recommendations. So recommendations is just the idea of you know, you're trying to recommend items, so ranking items. Um, so, you know, will a user like an item? Well, what are the basic patterns here? I think all of you will be familiar with these. Um, I can use local information, so if there's something about the item that matches with the user, so if there's a topic or a location, you know, certainly I can use that. But more interestingly, I can again use a kind of structural pattern where I say, well, if a user likes an item, there's another item that's similar to that item, then the user will like that item. Conversely, if a user likes an item, there's another user who's like that user or similar to that user, then user two will like that item. And this is um, kind of part of the foundation that goes into uh, doing uh, collaborative filtering, other styles of uh, hybrid recommender systems, combining all of these things together. What is the challenge? Um, well, you probably were already thinking this, which is, where did you get that similarity measure? You know, that's the heart of this. And one of the things in the methods that I'm going to propose is they're very nice for, you know, I have, you know, a bunch of different similarity measures. I can just throw them in and then I can um, uh, combine them together in a reasonable way and um, uh, learn which ones are important. So these structured prediction patterns um, are nice, but really I've found in the problems that we look at, 
Oftentimes, we want to combine all of them and do them all at once. So you need to do the information integration. You need to do the inference. You need to do the recommendation. You know, how do you do this, and how do you do it at scale um, in a reasonable way? So at this point, I want to go into a research method that addresses these challenges, and in particular, it addresses the challenge of modeling the relational structure, um, dealing with these heterogeneous um, interdependencies, and deals with noise and uncertainty. And so uh, my research for a long time has been, you know, how do you take this new, more nuanced approach to doing large-scale inference? And uh, most recently, my group has been focused on a tool which we call probabilistic soft logic. And um, uh, this URL has a lot more information about it, including code that's downloadable, open source, a bunch of examples, online tutorials, and so on. But the fundamental um, kind of rationale behind PSL is exactly to combine these data-driven algorithms with knowledge-based approaches where you can combine rules, like I just gave those patterns in, with um, statistical methods, combine logic and probability, and as you'll see, handle both kind of hard constraints and soft constraints and do it in a scalable way. So, uh, PSL is a probabilistic programming language for these collective reasoning problems where we're going to have rules like I just showed, but they're going to be weighted rules. And um, a PSL program is going to be some rules and data, but as I'll go over in the next several slides, that's going to actually define a probability distribution over all of the unknowns. And all of these unknowns can be these kind of structural um, uh, unknowns where there's dependencies. And it basically takes some of the um, things that are advantages of logical rules so that they capture structure and they're interpretable, um, as we just heard in the previous um, talk. The disadvantages of logical rules is they're intractable. Once you have inconsistencies, everything breaks down. And I had just told you about similarities. They don't deal well with similarities. So what we'll get out is an approach that is tractable that is able to handle inconsistencies and will be able to kind of represent similarities because the random variables will be continuous value between 0 and 1 rather than um, true, false, 0, 1 combinatorial. So to do this, I'm going to go into the kind of mathematical foundations for PSL. These were very much due to uh, my former PhD student, Stephen Bach, who is now an assistant professor at uh, Brown, and uh, former postdoc, Bert Wong, who's now an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. Um, but the nice thing is that they were able to show a mathematical equivalence where I'm going to now put up the functional form. And um, I want you to kind of blaze this into your brain, because I'm going to then show you how to derive it um, a couple different ways. So uh, I apologize at this point. I haven't given you the interpretation for this. So just remember the functional form. Uh, we're going to turn a logical inference into this concave maximization. And it's going to be motivated by results from theoretical computer science, from machine learning, and from AI. Three different motivations for it. So the first one, I think, is the one that will be kind of most familiar 
to a general computer science audience. Um, and this comes from randomized algorithms. And the randomized algorithms interpretation, uh, again, is um, we're going to take these weighted logical rules and we're going to write them in clausal form. So we'll write them as disjunctions, where the disjunctions, um, there's a weight that's associated with them. Then, this is a little bit clunky notation, but um, we're going to index over the positive literals and the negated literals. And so our weighted um, uh, set of rules will be um, written out this way. And the basic problem then is to solve the weighted max set problem, which is find the assignments to the random variables that maximize the number of satisfied rules. And I think all of you can hark back to your um, basic uh, uh, algorithms courses to remember that this was probably the poster child NP-hard problem that you learn. And so at this point, you're like, OK, well, this isn't helping us that much, giving us an NP-hard problem to look at. But now we're going to make use of a work from randomized algorithms where instead of viewing these as combinatorial variables, we're going to view them as rounding um, probabilities. So the probability that I round up to 1 or down to 0. And then there's a really nice result from Goymans and Williamson that showed how to bound the expected score of this. Uh, form with a linear program. And the nice thing about it is they also were able to show a three-quarters optimal um, guarantee on a greedy approach for doing the assignment. So that's nice. That is one way where if you were paying attention to me, you look, this is the functional form that I gave you a few slides ago. So that's uh, where that concave maximization comes from. Now, a second interpretation comes from the machine learning community from graphical models. And here, I'm writing the weighted rules in a different way where I have a factor graph, I have random variables, and then I have my rules. And now I'm going to do something kind of funky. I'm going to view the rules as potential functions, but they're weird potential functions. They're just these logical things that um, uh, rather than a general potential function. And I can write out a distribution for this, uh, which would be kind of the standard MRF form for uh, this kind of factor graph where it's um, the distribution is proportional to the weighted sum of these potentials. So this is just a generalization of the weighted max out from before. And again, the inference problem that I want to solve is one that maximizes the um, exponent here. So I'm trying to find the assignment that maximizes this. And so you know, then I'll do inference in graphical models. And so I could take an approach, a variational approach, where I'm trying to find a globally consistent um, set of marginal distributions that will solve that map inference problem. Um, the only problem with that, um, you know, I can express this as a linear program, but it has exponentially many constraints. So there's a long line of work uh, in local consistency relaxations for um, uh, graphical models that basically uh, solve the problem by ignoring some of the constraints and just looking at local um, consistency. We're going to do a similar thing where we take these marginal distributions, we're going to add in these pseudo marginals, we'll just ensure consistency here, then we can write the map problem in this format just now it's over this polytope, rather a simpler polytope. And then what 
Steve and Bert were able to do is to do some rewriting, making use of the KKT conditions to you know, get rid of theta and project it over the marginals and get out this form. And again, if you look at this form, this form has exactly the same functional form as before. So that was cool. They compared it to um, other approaches and showed some nice empirical results too. The cool thing about this result is this approximation guarantee from the weighted max set, we could then apply to the LCR, and this is something that that community never had. They had all these kind of techniques without these guarantees. The third interpretation that we used was from AI, from some um, area of soft logic, which is to directly reason about these random variables as continuous values. And in this community, they view them as either degree of truth or um, as similarities. And there's different ways of doing this. We chose purposely this Lukashevitz logic because it will result in a convex optimization. And in particular, the convex optimization, the objective looks like this. And now I'm actually going to give you some intuition for why um, you interpret it this way. Um, this is essentially the degree of satisfaction of each of the rules. And what I want to do is minimize the dissatisfaction of all of the rules. And again, we get the same form. So the cool thing we've been able to do is kind of show that these three different interpretations all lead to the same optimization. Um, and you know, I don't know about you, but I think it's really cool when under three different interpretations, you end up with the same uh, mathematical form. I, I think that that's um, showing there's something uh, very nice there. Again, I think there's still tons of work to be done here. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this is one way where you get to combining um, data and knowledge uh, in an interesting way. We ended up going further and extending this to something that we refer to as hinge loss mark of random fields, where we abstract things a little bit more. Um, we add arbitrary hard linear constraints and get um, this general form, but practically what does it look like? We can write a PSL program. So this PSL program is exactly the one for that voter problem that I gave earlier. And this um, program together with some data then defines a probability distribution. So cool. Um, and we've gone from something that's a combinatorial optimization to convex. You know, that's good. There's further systems things that we can do to really get this to scale. And I want to call out my current PhD student, Eric Augustine, who's been doing some really awesome systems work. I'm going to kind of breeze through this. But um, to scale inference further, it turns out there's a lot of fine-grained parallelism in these large models that we're producing with PSL programs. And so you can make use of that to decompose the optimization problem. And just like we heard in the previous talk, you know, there's lots of techniques you can use. We happen to use ADMM, uh, which ADMM, uh, the cool thing is you decompose it into subproblems, you solve those, you um, iterate and do message passing to uh, find a consistent solution. And if it's a convex problem, it's guaranteed to converge. What was the research issue here? The research issue was how to solve the subproblems quickly. And it turns out in our hinge loss mark of random fields, the potentials have a hinge form. And for these, there's a region, the flat region, where the rules just satisfied. You don't have to worry about it. 
there is an angled region where it's not satisfied. Um, and if you decompose it, you can end up with an often trivial set of linear equations. And so just through this technique, we were able to, if we compare PSL to uh, CVX Pi, a Python implementation of convex optimization in MOSSEC, a commercial grade. Um, this is a log scale. Um, we're able to solve problems with 150,000 potentials using the Python implementation, takes three hours, using MOSSEC, three minutes, PSL, a few seconds, and we can do things with 800 million potentials um, in just a few minutes. So. That's cool. We did further systems optimizations. Um, one of the places where these kinds of models spend the most time is in grounding, which is, this is the thing of taking our collection of rules and data to instantiate usually a really, really big graphical model. Um, so to speed this up, there is a couple standard techniques. One of them is blocking, which is just how do you rule out certain um, uh, potentials even from being considered? And the idea in blocking, so if you're doing a link prediction task where you potentially get an n squared blow up to reduce the set that are compared. There's a ton of kind of standard techniques for doing this. What we did was, yeah, so it basically is trying to reduce the size of these things that you do the full cliques over. Um, if you view this as a conjunctive query where the block is actually one of the components of the query, then you speed up this whole process very uh, much. And so this is work from Eric and former PhD student Theo Retkatsinas, who's now at University of Wisconsin on query optimization, where I'm going to kind of give the high level bits. Um, one is we're able to remove trivial potentials. These are ones that are just don't factor in. You can either do them within the database. This is actually what Tuffy does, and they showed a lot of speed up for doing that compared to uh, what was done in previous systems. What we did is we were able to show that you could do it externally, and even in a single threaded um, uh, implementation, as long as you have um, less than 80%, which is more than 80% would be a lot of trivial <laughs> potentials. Um, this is uh, faster than doing it within the database. And then if you do a little bit of parallelization, then it really makes sense to do this outside the database. Uh, we also have some work on query rewriting that takes into account the blocking and are able to get significant speed ups doing that. And further, um, then you can do some uh, query reuse. And so this is a nice example of kind of systems that will then help you um, uh, go further than we already did with our nice theoretical results. So a question is then, um, oh, and these are some nice results for, this is in the past three years of basically all the cool work that Eric has done. Uh, that has basically uh, sped up uh, PSL uh, significantly in, in each of these releases. So if you happen to use PSL, make sure you get the most recent release. Uh, so then how do we learn these things? Um, we have methods for doing weight learning, learning the weights of the rules, so those aren't things that you specify. Uh, we also have some current work on structure learning. How do you learn the structures of the rule in a data-driven way? How does this work? So we can do it fast. Um, here's some uh, examples of doing this on activity recognition in video. 
These are really simple PSL programs where you just add in a little bit of structure over some existing computer vision type features. You get a big boost in performance. Uh, comparing a PSL versus a discrete MRF on a collective classification and link prediction problem, you know, we do about as well in terms of accuracy, a little bit better, but we can do it a lot faster, and that's the big thing. Um, for similarity combinations, again, we have some work in computational biology where we put all of these together. So we have a lot of other projects. Um, I would love to talk about all of these where computational social science problems for online uh, discussion, cyberbullying, and more. Um, also looking at trust in models, but then also expanding on the information integration, some nice work on knowledge graph construction. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks about these. Uh, normally in a talk in a different venue, I would kind of expand on these applications. But here, I want to kind of pop up and get back to this topic of cautions. So I hope you feel like you've gotten some cool techniques for combining data and knowledge. But still, in these data-driven systems, machine learning and AI systems, uh, what can go wrong? Um, and then I'm going to argue, um, you know, using some knowledge is going to help you uh, uh, keep that from going wrong. It turns out a lot. And I'm going to do some examples that I've gotten from colleagues. Um, I think some of you will have seen these, um, uh, but let me go over them quickly. So the first one is an Amazon example. And so this is an example where Amazon was building a classifier to decide where they should deploy a premium service, where the premium service was a same-day service. And they built a classifier that was built on um, purchase history, income, and location. And for now, just look at the um, left side and look at this gray region. This is the region that did get the premium service. And this is Atlanta. It turns out the northern part of Atlanta got the service. This is Chicago. Everybody except the south side got the service. And this is Boston. Everybody except for people in Roxbury got the service. So, and then if you go back and look at the other side of the slide, you see what's true of those areas, those areas that didn't get the service were predominantly African American. And so while race wasn't explicitly used in the classifier, you know, not surprisingly, if you use those attributes, guess what? You're going to get something that um, comes out like this. And so they got a lot of flack for this. And eventually, um, my understanding is um, all areas do get this service. Uh, Another example, um, I don't really mean to be Amazon bashing, but, but this, don't worry, Google's coming up next. Um, <laughs> uh, was, uh, that, I mean, all these things, they get a lot of press, right? So I think you guys have seen these. Was um, they built an AI tool that was supposed to help them hire, and guess what? They trained it on their data. Their data was predominantly male, and guess what? The predictions came out. You know, uh, not surprising. Um, Google examples, um, uh, there's a bunch of different ones. Uh, this one is uh, from the Smart Compose, where if you used Smart Compose or algorithm, if you had some um, uh, position like CEO, it would always turn that into a he and so on, so they ended up taking it out of, as a feature. 
Um, a similar uh, example in Google Translate, if you take a gendered language like English, she is a doctor, he is a nurse, um, translate it into Turkish, which isn't gendered, translate it back into English, you get he is a doctor, she is a nurse. Um, but probably the one that got the most attention is this um, ProPublica example. And so I'm just curious, how many of you have seen this example? OK, I always like, feel like I shouldn't, like everybody's seen this and I shouldn't repeat it. But if you haven't seen it, it's important to see. Um, so there is a system that's built that is used throughout the criminal justice system. So it's used in sentencing, it's used in bail, and so on, uh, where um, they make use of you know, some um, large set of features to predict uh, recidivism risk. And so this is the likelihood of a defendant committing a crime um, in the future. And what ProPublica did is they studied a specific county and were able to show that uh, the um, false positive rate was twice as high for African Americans and the false negative rate was twice as high for Caucasian um, defendants. And so it over predicts recidivism for African Americans and under predicts recidivism for whites. And so on all of these, you know, what went wrong? Well, as machine learning researchers, we probably are quick to say that, okay, if you have biased data coming in, where the biased data is either due to selection bias or through kind of some sort of institutional bias or societal bias, then no surprise, you're going to get outputs that are biased. And so this is the famous um, computer science uh, maxim, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but it's interesting to think about kind of what other biases are an issue uh, potentially. And one of them that's important to think about is automation bias. And automation bias is the idea that, you know, humans have this way of, you know, well, you know, the algorithm told me this, so, you know, they trust the output of algorithms in a way um, uh, that maybe um, causes them to ignore contradictory information. And actually, in the case of the recidivism algorithm, it was actually even worse than that. If a judge went against the recommendation from the algorithm, then at least in some states, they actually had to write a report saying why they disagreed with it. And so you can imagine that having that extra burden um, would have additional uh, uh, bad effects. And all of this goes into um, this area, kind of algorithmic discrimination. The idea that algorithms can amplify existing bias in the data. They can actually operationalize it at scale in a way that would have been hard to do in the past. And they can legitimize it because, again, it was like, well, you know, this fancy machine learning algorithm told me this, you know, I can't go against that. So the good news is this is receiving increasing attention. Um, so this whole area of fairness in machine learning, this is a slide from Salon Barakas and Moritz Hart from a tutorial they gave, has gone up exponentially. Uh, there have been a number of workshops that look at fairness, accountability, transparency in machine learning systems. And there's a new conference, ACM conference. And this conference is specifically designed to bring together researchers from um, machine learning, but also from social sciences and so on to 
even talk about you know, what does fairness mean. Um, interestingly enough, there has also been some criticism of this line of work. So um, uh, some of the science, technology, and society folks are kind of like, you know, you're just um, putting, putting in these mathematical interpretations, but not really getting at the, the complexities of the issues. But I think the exciting thing is there is starting to be um, kind of places where I think initially each of the communities kind of wasn't really collaborating and understanding each other, but there's starting to be things that really do kind of go deeper on this and kind of new things that I don't think either community would have thought of without talking to the other. Um, further, there's uh, uh, this quote that I really like from Bill Howe that says, you know, responsibility means going beyond technical or technocratic solutions to also involve substantive debates about ethics, values, and competing interests. How is ethical expertise defined? Who gets to be at the table? What are the limits of certain kinds of solutions? And it's even gotten to the point that policymakers are doing things. So there's a New York City automated decision systems law, uh, one of the first in the country where they're looking at this. And so I think this uh, is all a very uh, good development. Um, but I want to talk about actually what else can go wrong besides bias. Um, I think we need to look at this. but. There's a bunch of other things that go wrong that I think people aren't talking about as much as they should be talking about. And one of the basic things is a lot of these algorithms just have really poor quality. Like even if you look at that example, this thing only had 61% accuracy. It's like, you're gonna deploy something like this in a setting for something that's that important? Um, Another thing is this kind of magical thinking. And I do have to admit that I think some of this magical thinking around AI is um, most prevalent in some of the work on deep learning where there's, I mean, deep learning methods are awesome at being able to come up with these function approximators, these universal function approximators that are um, great. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of work that shows when you dive deeper and understand what they're learning, um, you know, this is a, the old example that probably a lot of people have seen. Um, you have an algorithm for checking whether it's a husky or a wolf. Um, then you look a little bit deeper, it turns out it learned that well, all of the wolves were on snow, all of the huskies were on grass, so it was really a snow and grass detector. Um, and this work by Rich Karuna um, uh, was basically friends don't let friends deploy uh, black box models, being able to say, you know, you need to be able to understand what's really coming out of the models. And um, I do think this um, article from Wired Greedy, uh, brittle, opaque, and shallow, the downsides of deep learning um, uh, captures it in a kind of snarky way. Uh, so unpacking the back black box means unpacking you know, what's really going on in our machine learning systems. Um, another issue is just feature validity. So this is a part of domain literacy. This example is an example of a deep learning algorithm that was lear learned to predict criminality based on facial characteristics. And this was based on 2,000 Asian faces. You know, they had some pretty um, strong claims about it. But the idea that you would, I don't care what kind of accuracy your model's getting, you know, thinking through a little bit like, do the features that I'm using, am I willing to make these predictions based off them? You know, forget causal modeling, just basic feature validity is an important piece. Um, 
And a component of statistical literacy is when you have these crazy high dimensional settings, you can learn pretty much anything. And um, this is a particularly egregious example of a number of different things, but um, uh, just being aware that when you have high dimensions, you're more prone to overfitting ever than before. And this is an example where they were trying to predict terrorists from some data. And what they did was they had seven known terrorists. And then they had a random sample of 100,000 mobile phone users. They trained on six of them and then predicted the seventh. You know, th this is just, um, uh, and then, and, you know, not surprisingly, it identified a, a Al Jazeera reporter as a potential terrorist uh, from this. And so, kind of having the uh, ability to look at these and test one's statistical assumptions are incredibly important. There's something in AI called the frame problem that comes up over and over again. And the frame problem is simply any time you have a formalization of a problem, you have to leave out some of the consequences, some of the things that stay true. And so this means we can do things that are you know, great for narrow AI, but going to general AI, we really need to um, be able, cognizant of how pervasive this problem is. The next thing is values, taking into account that in all of these systems, they're essentially optimizing some metric. And there's a question of who gets to pick the metric, whose values are encoded in it are um, important. And then there's just, you know, we're computer scientists. There's just bad code. Bad code happens all the time. And we really need to have these kind of new software engineering methods that are able to take into account statistical comp components and concepts like generalizability and so on, and transparency and interpretability and enforce those. And then the last one is taking into account the social system, that algorithms can actually shape people. And so when we're looking at this social system, you know, uh, people adapt what they do based on um, what's happening in the socio-technical system. That's great if it's in a beneficial way, but if it's in a way that has unintended impacts, then that's a problem. So what is responsible data science? It's all of those things. It's also this area of data science for social good, exactly the things that working on societal problems, you can uncover the biases that are potentially in the systems by using data science and data analytic techniques. You can look at hard problems like homelessness and education, um, some work that a former student did uh, combining two hard problems, environment and human trafficking. But in general, we can kind of be at this place where we can build these socio-technical systems where we're being surveilled and everybody's angry and unhappy. Um, or we can um, build these socio-technical systems where we're um, helping uh, uh, people and um, maintaining good, so you can either have this kind of dystopian view for the socio-technical system or this utopian view. And we really need to be thinking about those. So which one will we choose? We need to think about it as a choice. And then going beyond the kind of knowledge base plus data-driven plus taking into account 
people and values gives us these human-centric systems. So in closing, I want to first off thank my students, Lisa's inquisitive students. I got to call out a few of them, um, but uh, they're awesome. They're one of the best things about being a professor. Uh, acknowledge my sponsors. Um, and then uh, we, I'm the director of this uh, D3 Data Science Research Center where we collaborate with industry and academia around responsible data science. And this is all around how do we develop these scalable um, models for these um, kind of social problem. So if this is something you're interested in, you know, please be sure and come talk to me. Uh, so I hope that I've been able to kind of teach you, excite you, caution you, but importantly give you these kind of tools so that you can go and have the conversations around responsible data science, um, around the literacy that's required, the computational literacy, statistical literacy, ethical literacy, and domain literacy, because I think it's a really important endeavor. So um, to promote this literacy, healthy skepticism that's required to do uh, responsible data science. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We have time for, uh, for a few questions. The microphones are in the aisles. So I can't see, so I'll let you call. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking Thank as well. Oh, over there. So um, does PSL um, help with any of the problems? Is there a connection between the second part of the talk and the last part of the talk? Yeah, so um, the connection that, especially if we would have dived deeper into those PSL applications, were many of them were around kind of detecting uh, various behaviors and so on. But the other piece, which I didn't get into so much, but this combination of knowledge and data because PSL allows you to state certain kinds of hard constraints and express knowledge, that's one way that you can um, enforce certain outcomes uh, and um, into the models that maybe may not be in the data so that you can mix like, okay, here's my domain knowledge, here's what I know that I would like to enforce and here's my data, how do I combine those together? And we found that PSL gives a nice framework for that, and in particular, it also does it in a way that supports kind of richer models, so that um, you don't have to be, have it just be attribute-based, but you can look at relations when you're doing it as well. Okay, follow-up question? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I also see some sort of a danger with those um, weights in the PSL. I mean, mm -hmm. there's been debates in the past where there's no such thing as degree of truth, and you're relying on some arbitrary rules when it comes to degree of truth, whereas, like, naturally, they should be probabilities, and they should... Um, so, I mean, if somebody's not very careful and define these, like, arbitrary weights, um, things can go the other way, too. Yeah, so I guess there's a couple different... Um um, things that that brings up. So one is um, the semantics of PSL are very interesting because on the one hand, some of it is motivated from soft logic, but then it actually does have a probabilistic interpretation. So if you are someone that are, is interested in, you know, what's the probabilistic interpretation, there is a probabilistic interpretation. The other piece is that the weights can be learned from data, so it's not that you just put them in. Um, so you have to decide when is it that you uh, do you want to learn them from data, when is it appropriate for you to kind of enforce them from the outside. 
But then the other thing that I hope, you know, maybe I didn't explicitly state it, uh, but maybe you can see from the take that I have towards machine learning and data science, I view it as a tool that, you know, you want to do it as a discovery process. It's uh, something where you, you know, do several models, you compare what you get out of them, and so on. And then where you have the appropriate statistical framework, then you can go back and do additional testing. And that's going to be very uh, problem dependent. Thank you. All right, let's thank Lisa one more time.